Welcome to the 258th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Talia Carner, author of the new novel, The Third Daughter. Stay tuned for the interview. This episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast is brought to you by Libro.fm. Libro.fm is the first and only company which lets you purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. Support your favorite local bookstore, and you can pick from more than 125,000 audiobooks, including New York Times bestsellers and recommendations from booksellers. You'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company out there. You know who I'm talking about, but you'll be part of a different story, one that supports your local bookstore. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out the recommendations and curated list from the people who know audiobooks best, your local bookseller. There's a special offer now for reading and writing podcast listeners. Get three audiobooks for the price of one, $14.99, with your first month of membership. Just use the code RWPODCAST. Again, that's Libro.fm, purchasing audiobooks from your local bookstore, and use the code RWPODCAST. Before I get into my interview with Talia Carner, I wanted to play an excerpt from the audiobook of her new novel, The Third Daughter. This audiobook is narrated by Saskia Marleveld, and it's available via Harper Audio. Again, this is a brief audiobook excerpt from Talia Carner's novel, The Third Daughter. Stay tuned for the interview. Part 1 No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. I do not know where I am going, where I have come from is disappearing. I am unwelcome and my body is burning with the shame of not belonging. Warson Shire Chapter One Batya's family had been on the road for two days when a kind innkeeper who had been Coppel's customer allowed them to settle on the hay in his barn. He brought over a pot of steaming soup, rich with vegetables and three-day-old bread. Hunger and fatigue had knitted into Batya's body, Her feet throbbed from the day's long flight. Her blisters oozed, and she couldn't wait to release her feet from the clogs. Her stomach rumbled. Wait, her father said, as the four of them sat down around the bowl set on the ground. He dipped his fingers into a bucket of water and mumbled the blessing for the food so fast that his words jumbled. The soup smelled delicious, and Batya had already torn a piece of bread and dipped it, when her mother, her hungry eyes on the food, said, It's not kosher. Not kosher. Batya's hand hung in midair, the aroma filling her mouth with saliva. Her father winked at her. It is said in the good book, all that are hungry should come and feast. It's in the Passover Haggadah's tradition about inviting strangers into our home for the meal, Batya replied. It had nothing to do with breaking the kashrut prohibition that required adherence to strict Jewish ritual in the slaughtering of animals and food preparation. Still, smiling at her father's permission, she put the bread in her mouth, then dipped a spoon in the bowl. Surale followed. Straightening, Batya noticed that her parents still sat back on their haunches. She took in her mother's pale face, and a wave of protectiveness washed over her. Pikuach nefesh, she said, referring to the principle that the preservation of human life overrode any other commandments, even the laws of Kashrut. Another Talmudic maven in the family, her mother replied. Nevertheless, to Batya's satisfaction, she dipped her spoon in the bowl. As the flavor filled Batya's mouth, her relief was instantly dampened by the vision of Miriam lying spread eagle, covered in blood. The screams Batya had heard coming from her friend's house while hiding with Surale in a nearby tree resounded in her ears. She shook her head to make them disappear, 
She mustn't weaken her spirit with the horrific sights and sounds of the past. Her father was unloading the bundle of beddings. Batya rose to help, and as soon as she stretched their one feather bed on the hay, her mother lowered herself to lie down. A cry of pain escaped her lips. Surale dropped down next to her. Mama, Mama, what's the matter? She needs to rest, Batya said. The fear and worry that had accompanied her for days returned to fill her lungs. Make Mama healthy and strong, she prayed. She found a pail inside the barn door and rushed to the well by the trough. Hanging with all her weight on the handle of the pump, she managed to bring up water, then carried the heavy pail to the barn. She ladled water with their tin cup and, propping her mother's shoulders, brought it to her mother's lips. Sleep now, Batya told her after a few sips, gently lowering her mother's head. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Talia Karner, author of the new novel, The Third Daughter. Talia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jeff, for having me here. Great. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about your new novel, The Third Daughter, yet, can you describe it? Yeah, for anyone who, have, who has ever seen Fiddler on the Roof, after Tevye and his family leave the stage... What happens next? In the same short story collection by the storytelling writer, Sholem Aleichem, appears another short story called The Men from Buenos Aires. That short story, by the way, is now translated new on my website. And the story is about a very shady character that the author, Shalom Alecha, meets. And he brags about his business success without never explaining the nature of his enterprise in Buenos Aires. But what he is, is really a trafficker. Since the story of Tevye, the one who had supposedly seven daughters, then he reported six daughters, then only told the stories about five, and only three of them were included in the Fiddler on the Roof version. I took the liberty of taking one of the daughters whose stories we never heard of and said, let's see what happens if after they escape the pogrom, the family meets this shady man from Buenos Aires. And that is the beginning, how the, the book starts. And the man is actually a sex trafficker. We know very much about the pogroms that were the a, a tragedy of the Jews in Eastern Europe. Under the czar, the edicts were to convert, exile, or kill the Jews. And they, he did everything possible. The life was really miserable and made it very possible for anyone to fall into the false promises that traffickers offered then, 120 years ago, the same as they do today, unfortunately. And the stories, uh, I called the girl, the daughter Batya, I did not want to reiterate the stories of all the five daughters before her whose stories Sholom Aleichem told. So I just took two for in order to, to create the family motivation and then went on and changed the names for that reason. And Batya is 14 years old as she's and she and her parents the character of Tevye is very clear and her mother in the opening couple of chapters. They fall for it. They agree to let her live with him with a promise of a marriage in, a, in two years. And she is then forced into prostitution. The Most of the book takes place in Buenos Aires. Once she's there and she has to make the, she has the moral dilemma first. She wants to commit suicide like many, many girls 
in that situation that had been forced into prostitution. That moral dilemma never leaves her, but her motivation to stay alive is to get her family out of Russia, out of that misery and strife. And that is the book, most of the book, <laughs> we get to see as new dilemmas come into her life when she may has to make more decisions. In the meanwhile, she becomes a tango dancer. There are more moments of some fun, not just all misery eventually as she makes her life as a prostitute, but she has a chance to try to bring down that prostitution ring. And that, that's when she uh, gets herself into more action of a different kind. The background, the historical background of this novel is fascinating and unfortunately unknown to anybody so far that I've been talking to. And that is, they, there was a legal trafficker ring that operated with impunity for 70 years, 70 years, headquartered in Buenos Aires, stretched, of course, into Rio de Janeiro, Montevideo, and, and many other places, including the Lower East Side and as far as Beijing. And that legal trafficker ring, it was a union of um, mutual benefits for its members who were up to 500 pimps at the height of the organization's existence. For any of your listeners who want to Google it, you'll be amazed. The name is Zvi Migdals. It's uh, spelled Z-W-I. The second word is M-I-G-D as in David A-L. Zvi Migdal. And it's amazing how much material we have, how much documentation exists. But it was tremendous amount of research that had to be done in order to finally assess how many women victims were part of this ring for this period of 70 years, so starting in 18. 1870 until 1939, and the victims were all Jewish girls from Eastern Europe. So this is heartbreaking, and I felt that these women were shunned once they arrived in South America. They were shunned by the Jewish community, who did not see them as victims and did not even extend to them any of the services that were available social services, including burial services. Burial was extremely important to these women because they remained Jewish and religious in spite of everything. And they believed that once they went to the next world and they will meet God, they did not want to come to him as solid and impure as the filth of their life was on earth. So the ritual of burial, cleansing before it, was an extremely important process that was denied these women by that very same Jewish community. And they started their own, bought their own land to have their own cemeteries and their own, their own um, services, burial services. And, and so how did you discover this uh, um, trafficking ring when you started researching? Is I knew something about it. That I knew that there had been a history of prostitutes and pimps in Argentina. I'd been in Buenos Aires three times. And in 2007, I went to the, I was at the Jewish library and I chatted with the librarian in English and then I said to her, what's, what's the story about the, the prostitutes and the pimps? And suddenly she forgot her English. I do not speak Spanish. My accent is Israeli, by the way. So I, um, 
But the minute she forgot her English, I knew I stumbled upon a very shameful secret, something nobody wanted to talk about it. And and I let it be until some other things came together and the voices of these women whose stories nobody ever told just kept plugging at me. And, and I, I kept hearing in my head this echo of their cries and I felt compelled to just sit down and write their story and any such story fictional story that comes into within the framework of a historical content deals with it's a story of one person and that one person we want we want to know how how her spirit rises over the the, the forces that shape our lives, be it geographical, religious, economic, political, sociological, whatever are the forces, and we are all are shaped by different forces. None of us, if we live on a mountain, we are mountain people. If we, we live by the sea, we are fish, fishing people. That's what a, a part of the beginning of what we are being affected by but of course religion and psychological effects are extremely strong and I wanted to show how I learn myself how this particular one girl who is subjugated and stuck in this traffickers ring how she deals with it with the, and how her spirit rises above all of that and that's what the story of uh, the third daughter so Prior to writing novels, you worked in magazine publishing. What prompted you to write your first novel? My work in magazines was the business side. I was never a writer. I remember the first time as a publisher of Savvy Magazine that I had to sign a check for and then uh, some articles that were writers who wrote articles, and I was shocked that at that time they were making a thing uh, 10 cents a word or something. I was shocked at how little they made. I didn't know anything about the writing world. I was always in a business world, and for me it was one career that was magazine publishing was part of marketing and advertising. It was one career. Because I was in the advertising side and the marketing, helping clients get their reach their audiences and so on. I was also a volunteer counselor for the Small Business Administration for specifically women's programs, and I mostly in New York City. But we sometimes got women from other countries who arrived to us and I gave them workshops but a big change happened in 1993 when I was asked to travel to Russia shortly after the fall of communism to teach Russian women entrepreneurial skills and I was fascinated by the challenge and I went twice in May and in October 93 Unfortunately, the second time I was caught in the uprising of the Russian parliament against Boris Yeltsin, and I ended up being on a run from the militia in a quite a harrowing event in my life. And my uh, report to the USIA, US Information Agency, that had sent me to Russia, uh, that was a 23-page report that turned into a maiden novel that never got published, but 20 years later, I used my material and my research when I wrote the uh, novel Hotel Moscow. So I couldn't even use that original material because that had been on DOS and I couldn't retrieve <laughs> any of my original writing, but that's okay. I had all my files with research and I uh, was a much better writer. And that's my previous novel that came out in 2015, Hotel Moscow. But that's what started my career. And within three weeks after I'd started to write, I told my husband that I wanted to be a kept woman. <laughs> and because that's the only way I could write full time. 
And in his usual composure, he says, yes, darling. And that made it possible for me to uh, start writing full time. And it was not until this was 93, end of like November, ni- November 3rd, 1993, at 2.48 p.m. actually was when I first started to write. And I had my first novel published in 2006. So it was quite a few years. Wow, that so I, that was uh, over 10 years. Well, um, Nine, 93, yeah, yes. 13 yes. years. Wow. Yeah, 13 years. No, no, 2002, I'm sorry. Okay. 2002, nine years later, yep, nine my years. first novel, Puppet Child, came out. And then in 2006 was China Doll. And then in 2011, Jerusalem Maiden. And 2015, Hotel Moscow. So, and now 2019 is the third daughter. It takes me four or five years to write a novel. So, so given your experience of, of writing the the novels, I mean, first it taking you nine years to to get the first one published, and then the others that you just uh, recounted. Um, what advice would you have for someone who's listening who may be an aspiring novelist? First of all, write and revise and study the craft of writing. I see now so much going on with. Uh, self-publishing just the other night a friend was telling me that another friend somebody i don't know wrote something in january and now put it online published it on amazon or something and you know what it's like you've taken four months of piano lessons and then you rent a carnegie hall to give a concert it's embarrassing if all your family sat in a concert <laughs> hall, they would be embarrassed. And I would say to any inspiring, aspiring writer, do not think that you are ready for Carnegie Hall. You are not Dostoevsky. And, you know, sight unseen, I can say that you need to learn the craft and the craft of fiction writing involves pacing and dialogue and characterization, uh, the way to build a scene, how to create tension from in every sentence and every paragraph. Uh, Stephen King has a fabulous book about that. Read, I read 20 books about the craft of writing. I went for three years... I was a conference and workshop writing junkie. I moved from one to another, to another, to another. And I learned and I studied. I had my writing group and then another, and now I have another. Depends on the level, but I always got feedback from other writers. And sometimes they're not good. You have to, it's like in a, a matchmaking, trying to find your the right person to share your life. You need to find the right group of at least three people or more who really can give you constructive feedback, not just say, I like it, I don't like it. You know, that's not good enough. You need very specific uh, feedback that tells you that, the pacing is wrong or the characterization of one in one page does not match the characterization in in a second page and you need to reconcile it. They don't tell you what to do, but they notice things that you are, as a writer, you're so inside it, you just don't see it. So it's a lot of work. Jerusalem, my novel Jerusalem Maiden, for example, I edited and rewrite and revised and reread it I'm not exaggerating, exaggerating if I say 80 times. Wow. And uh, for um, the third daughter that's coming out in 10 days on September 3rd, I would say about only 40 times. So, you know, anyone who thinks they can write, start writing in January and publish in, in August – they, uh, it, it, it cannot be anything but a horrible, amateurish attempt at something, but it's not a novel. Now, that said, there's a whole new world of nonfiction 
that has different rules and and many people are experts in their fields and have written a lot about that maybe in forms of uh, uh, maybe uh, proposals and industry overviews and and uh, maybe instruction manuals. They that's different. They may be able to write something in a period of uh, uh, several months, a year. I'd say give it two years just to be safe. But they they may have a book that's different. But fiction, like good music, needs a lot of learning and studying. Great. Well, what what books, fiction or nonfiction, have you read recently that made an impression on you and that you would recommend? So I loved reading Robert Caro's book recently, Working. Now, all of Robert Caro's books are major historical books, biographies. Each one is a doorstopper. They're so big. But Working is a biography, autobiography of mostly about his work life. And it's not as big and it's fascinating. And of course, he's a very good writer. So I really enjoyed learning the, about the struggles that he went through to get some of his books published. Um, he could not meet deadlines as he started following more alleys into more research and one at one point he was so many years behind his deadline that he and his wife had no money and she sold the house from under him under him and they had to move he had come came home to find that they no longer let live there and then another time following the story they moved all the way down to some southern southern state to follow for three years to become in to integrate themselves into the community that would otherwise not talk to outsiders, certainly not to Yankees. So I, I, I found that fascinating, and I really love that book, Working by Robert Caro. Alicia Drake, the book is I Love You Too Much, which is a terrible title about a, a young boy around 14 growing up in Paris. His parents are getting divorced and he gets stuck in all of his views of the adult world and how he cannot live up to the expectations of his parents to begin with. And he meets this other girl who's very troubled and uh, their friendship. It's very interesting. So I, I thought it was a very good book. I read Educated by Tara Westover, which is an excellent biography. And another excellent nonfiction, fabulous, is uh, by David Gran, G-R-A-N-N, -N, Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murder, and the birth of the FBI in Osage County, in what we call Indian Native Americans were being killed one by one, and uh, had to do with the fact that they were sitting on incredible oil wells, and on in their lands. And uh, this is a fabulous investigation into it. Great. And uh, another, I would like to mention The Guest Room by uh, Chris Bohajelian. And the reason I'm mentioning that one is because it deals with sex trafficking today with two young women from Russia who are invited to a bachelor, bachelor party, which is such a common thing as dancers, and then what happens. And I thought this is a good fiction. And which I recommend because the problem that I write about in The Third Daughter doesn't go away, has not gone away, unfortunately. And in the guest room, it, uh, Chris Bohajelian brings it up again and shows us more about it, the, the inside view. That sounds great. Those are all good books. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Talia Karner, author of the new novel, The Third Daughter. The book is in bookstores now, so go grab a copy or download the ebook. 
And Talia, thanks for doing this interview. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. And may I also mention my website? Yes, absolutely. Where they can, the readers can read the first chapter of each of my novels, but also read some additional information relating to the historical background of the third daughter. www.taliacarner.com. That is www.t-a-l-i-a-c. A R N as in Nancy E R dot com. Great. Thank so, you. So Thank you, check Jeff, that out. so much. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. Not since flying reindeer have the holidays seen something so amazing. Just in time to make selfie-ready holiday hair easy. Introducing the do-it-all styling tools for glam holiday hair. The holidays are happier with glam hair. And the Not Doctor all-in-one dryer brushes from Conair makes it easy. Detangle, dry, and style in one step. No elf needed. The Not Doctor collection has a dryer brush for every hair type and style. The Pink Smoothing Paddle dryer brush has flexible bristles for painless detangling and high performance power for quick styling and smooth shiny results and the purple dryer brush comes with a bonus volumizing attachment to boost lift and volume at the roots it's perfect for salon blowouts at home and since they're ideal for every hair type and length they make great gifts for everyone on your list who wants beautiful hair without the hassles shop the not doctor dryer brushes at conair.com or at your favorite retailers now